So here's the demo that I've screwed up on um, Wednesday. I don't see I screwed up. That's an awfully strong word. Uh, I was off by like a little scale factor. I don't even want anyone to lose sleep over it. Um, but essentially, here's the deal, right? So the red, the red uh, plot, that's the, um, the actual Fourier transform of the single square pulse. And then the blue sticks are the blue sticks are basically that's the Fourier series of the repeating version. Okay, and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the period of the repeating version. Okay, and you can see that they're they're following the same envelope. I'm just getting more and more samples along that envelope. All right, and as my period gets bigger, my repeating signal starts to look more and more like just the single pulse signal. And while that's doing that, if you look at the plot on the top, the samples that we were taking along the Fourier series start to look more and more, basically converge to the Fourier transform. So if I go to something crazy like uh, 50 or, God forbid, 100, okay, you can see that basically what I'm winding up with is just a bunch of samples along the Fourier series, the Fourier transform. So they, they converge to each other. So that was sort of the moral of the story is that as as your period gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you basically make yourself, instead of a, a periodic signal, you make yourself an aperiodic signal, then what's happening in the frequency domain is that your, your, um, your harmonics get closer and closer together until in the magical event when capital T goes to infinity, your harmonic, the spacing between harmonics goes to zero and then they sort of fuse and you get a continuous function as a function of frequency. All right. Yeah, I was waiting till I debugged it to post it. I will happily put it online um, right after class. Yes, and there is. Uh, if I just put more in more harmonics in my estimate, it would it would line up nicer. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Does what become a flat line? Yeah. Oh, it's getting less smooth? Yeah, that's only because I as I made it as I made the period bigger, I wind up needing more harmonics to make it look nice. I mean look, you want to make it 250 harmonics in the bottom one? Now it's sharper. Right? I mean it's just I mean, we all know that in order to make it perfect, I need to put infinity harmonics. It's just a matter of, you know, how many I put in there. And I like to keep it relatively small just to make my point so it doesn't take too long to run. Okay, but if, you know, if we feel better making it 250, then we'll make it 250. Okay, everybody's happy. So I'll put that code online now, uh, and hopefully you can play around with it. Good? Okay, so I've got, like, sort of two things planned for today. You have a test next Wednesday. Nod your heads. Pretend like this isn't the first time you're hearing this. OK, good. Um, I put a bunch of practice exams online. Did everybody see those? OK. Now, a word of notice. Um, every time I teach this course, uh, the semester goes like at a different pace, depending on sort of the general skill level of the students and the number of questions I get. And sometimes we give the exams at different points in the semester. Therefore, there are definitely going to be questions in some of those exams where you read them and you're like, what? We haven't done that yet. Am I responsible for that? And the answer is, of course not. We're only responsible for the stuff that we've done in the course this semester. Okay? Some of those tests that you're looking at, we maybe gave the test a little bit later in the semester and had a chance to get two or three more weeks of material in. Therefore, I was testing on two or three weeks more of material. So, don't panic. If you see something that's like totally foreign to you, um, let us not worry about that. Uh, this exam will go through Fourier series, the Fourier transform stuff that we started uh, on Wednesday. Uh, that will save that for for exam two. Sound reasonable? All right. Um, would it be helpful if I allocated Monday's lecture for doing a review? Okay. Here's how this is going to work. <clears throat> I am going to come to class unprepared. You are going to come to class prepared to ask questions. Okay? And those questions, sort of like the more specific you can ask the question, the better off. So 
you've read a problem, you've tried to work it, you couldn't understand how to solve it, you got stuck somewhere. That's a great question. We can talk about why you're stuck. Um, a lousy question is, could you work problem three for me because I couldn't be bothered to work it myself, right? Or I looked at it and I got scared and I didn't feel like working it. That doesn't help you very much. So um, come to class prepared. I will post solutions to the practice exams. Uh, let me see when I'm going to post those. Oh, I'm going to say after class on Monday. So um, do we have recitation problems then on Monday? Yes, you're going to have recitation on Monday. Okay. Sorry. That's cool, I mean, yeah. Just want to know. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have recitation on Monday, which reminds me, I need to make recitation questions. Um, I have them, I just need to post them. Um, yeah, so, so uh, come prepared with questions. I will post solutions. My whole thing is I don't like to post the solutions right away because I feel there is value in you struggling without the answers in front of you, right? If you read the question, you don't understand it, and you ask your friend for help, and you argue over it, and like you, you, you fill up pages and paper of like paper with calculus that doesn't make any sense, like that's how you learn. If I give you the solutions, it's human nature. All you're going to do is you're not going to try working the problem yourself. You're just going to read the solution and be like, oh, yeah, I totally understand that which is a totally different kind of learning than like banging your head against a table and saying, I don't understand this at all. And then eventually you learn it and you're like, oh, I've got it. Like it's yours now. You own it. So that's the kind of learning I'm trying to incentivize. You'll get the solutions. I'm just not giving them to you just yet. All right. If it gets to Monday night and I forgot to post them, please let me know. Um, it's not because I'm trying to be a jerk. Uh, okay. Questions? So Monday, you guys come prepared. I come unprepared. All right, um, so, okay, how am I going to do this? All right, um, yeah, yeah, well, uh, where could you get more practice? A couple places. Um, one place you could look, I think I posted this in the, um, in the initial handout, the old textbook that we used to use for this course that I wound up getting rid of after I wrote my own book. Uh, let's see, do I list it in the introductory handout? I do. It's, it's listed in the introductory handout, Signal Processing and Linear Systems by Laffey. It's in the library somewhere. It's filled with problems, A to Z, work them. So, but, you know, I, I posted like five old exams. You know, and each one's got you know, four multi-part problems in them. I mean, that's, I'm sort of running out of th questions I could even ask, right? So I don't, one of my things is I try not to reuse old exams, which means writing exams turns into a giant pain. But, um, you know, I like to think that I've created a giant body of problems now that's useful to you. Okay. Um, that's awesome. So what, what I want to do, uh, I sort of have two goals for today. One is to talk very briefly about, like a little bit theoretically, what, what the Fourier series means and the Fourier transform mean. And then we're going to do some examples. So probably what you're going to find is like maybe the next three or four lectures, uh, we're going to be looking at the, I mean, you can take a Fourier series of, a Fourier transform of any signal, right? I mean, any signal that I can write x of t equals, you know, uh, a rectangular pulse, a triangular pulse, like an audio signal, anything that's versus time, we can take the Fourier transform of. However, there are a handful of like special functions which happen to be really useful, okay? And we're going to spend some time just talking about what those special functions are and kind of talking a little bit about what their properties are. And they wind up being really useful. Like if you master them, then they'll pop up in all these unusual places. And you're like, yeah, I totally know how to handle that because I remember, like we studied that. That was one of those special cases that, you know, that keeps appearing. So we'll start with one of those today. But first, I just wanted to talk very briefly about Fourier. Awesome. OK. Um, is there a trash can in the back I can fling this into gloriously? I left all my good markers on my desk. Uh, well, hold on. There's a bunch here. Hold on. Don't. Let's. I am. I mean, I have. There we go. I got a marker. I'm good. I have a, a bunch of good ones on my desk, but that doesn't do me any good here. Okay. 
Uh, I always buy them myself just because they're like three bucks and it's easier than figuring out which form to fill out. But, you know, I'm sure they would buy them if I asked. They, they usually leave some, somebody's leaving them up here. Um, okay, so when we did Fourier series, <coughs> right, we had some formula. Well, even that marker's not all that impressive. Can you guys read that or is that too much of a mess? I'm sorry, I promise on Monday I'll remember my real markers on my desk. They're so close, they're just upstairs. All right, so <clears throat> what it was was we, we figured out how to take uh, a signal and break it into a bunch of cosines, right? And what we figured out was is that you could then, if you knew A sub n, you could take your, you could, you could rebuild x of t, how? If you know a sub n, how can we rebuild x of t? Yeah, magnitude. Right, so it's 2 magnitude a sub n cosine of omega. And what is omega n in terms of? Yeah, it's 2 pi n over big T plus the phase angle of a sub n. And then we do what? That's just, sum that, right? Over n equals 1 to infinity. Plus maybe an a sub 0 term if you have one. Sound good? OK. Now, with Fourier transform, it's a little trickier. Man. I think I made it worse. Only the best. OK, so with the Fourier transform, we, we're saying that instead of A existing only at certain harmonic frequencies, now A is a continuous function of frequency. All right, And there's a formula for it, right? We talked about the formula. You integrate over all time x of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And I pointed out that it was kind of amusing that the Fourier transform integral is really a lot simpler than the Fourier series integral, right? We've actually made life a little easier for ourselves, not harder, which is always cool. Um, so really, just the thing that I wanted to talk about briefly is how can I rebuild my signal x of t from, from that? So in other words, if I know my a of omega, can I rebuild my, is that give me enough information to rebuild x of t? You still need a magnitude, I guess, and a phase angle. Okay. So I'm going to take 2 times the magnitude of a of omega cosine omega t plus phase angle of A of omega. So pick some frequency omega. That's the cosine that goes along with that particular omega. OK? Ah, there's the rub. Now, over here, I was doing a sum, right? I had the first harmonic, the second harmonic, the third harmonic. I had to add them up individually. How's that going to work over here? Am I doing a sum as well? You have to integrate. Oh, I have to do what? I have to integrate. This is the worst news ever. Yes, absolutely. You have to integrate, right? Because here, there's not like a first harmonic and a second harmonic. It's a frequency, and frequency is continuous. I have to get every single one, not just omega equals 1 and omega equals 2, but I got to get omega equals 1.5 and omega equals 1.25 and omega equals 1.125 and so on and so forth. There's an infinite number of omegas. I mean, this one had an infinite number of harmonics, but they were spaced apart, and you could add them together. Here, they're infinite, and they're infinitely close to each other. Then you wouldn't get, how do you mean? Like, like you did, technically. OK. Um, you technically had the temp plot, but I... Right, so when you're looking at the MATLAB plot, it's a discrete approximation of a continuous signal. But the actual math, you're integrating. Well, of course, because in a computer, 
In a computer, by definition, you're obliged to work with a list of numbers. Yeah. There's no such thing as a continuous number on a computer, right? I can't say, um, you know, I, I can't create a continuous list of numbers from 1 to 5, let's say. The best I can do is take that 1 to 5 and break it into, you know, 1, 1 1.1, 1.2. .1, I can make the width between those numbers really small, but I, there's no such thing as continuous on a computer. So by definition, whenever you work on a computer, you're doing a discrete approximation. OK, what frequencies am I integrating over? Well, first of all, what am I integrating? Sorry. Let me ask you a better question. D, D what? D omega. I'm integrating over all frequencies. Zero to infinity. And I'm pretty sure there's a 1 over 2 pi term out front that I never really understood where it came from. But there's a scale factor out front of 1 over 2 pi. Like I can never remember quite where that appears from. Pretty cool, eh? So just to keep in mind, that's what we're doing. We're taking our signal, and we're breaking it into a sum of cosines. All right? All, all the... Fourier transform tells us is how much you have of each cosine, how much amplitude and how much phase you have of each cosine. But really, what it's all about at the end of the day is saying, hey, this signal can be built as a sum of cosines. Oh, yeah? Tell me, what frequencies and how much? And that's what the A term tells you. It tells you how much you have of each cosine. Oh, uh, no, no. You're just amazed. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful. OK, it is, it's kind of cool, right? OK, and again, the reason we care so much about cosines is that they have this magical property that when you stick them into a circuit, what comes out the other end is also a cosine at the same frequency, right? That's the magical, no other signal has that property. So if we can understand, if we can take a signal and break it into cosines, and we can understand a circuit in terms of how it treats each cosine, we have a really cool way of understanding circuit operation. And I should point out that what we're talking about isn't even all that specific to circuits, right? We're talking about circuits because we're electrical engineers. But I can guarantee you, <laughs> mechanical engineers are having the same conversation with the same math, OK? Frequency, any physical system that can be like, that is linear and time invariant can be modeled. Uh, it has this property that if you put in a sinusoidal input, you get a sinusoidal output. So the mechanical engineers are learning this. I'm guessing the civils are learning it too. Um, and basically, this is common to all engineering. You're just learning it in the context of circuits. But you know, if, you're, if your mechanical engineers are designing like uh, some sort of damping, like a shock absorber for a car, we used this uh, example in circuits too the other day. But you know, if you were to, um, you know, if, if this car were to go over a bump, all right, what comes out is some sort of, you know, some sort of damped out, you know, underdamped output. So this is a case where the shape of the input doesn't equal the shape of the output. But if you were to instead stimulate the spring with a cosine, what would come out would also be a cosine at the same frequency. It's all the same math. So just keep that in mind: is that we're talking about circuits, but this applies to just about everything. So it's like good, good stuff to have. All right, we good? OK, let's try this. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's Friday, right? We just, we just got to get through 20 more minutes, and we'll call it a day. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, I don't think the problem is that Temple is B-plus students going to a a plus school. I think it's A plus students dealing with a C minus physical space. Has anybody here been caught in the elevators yet? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been here long enough. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm gonna write on. Wait, well, <laughs> All right. Um, 
I guess I'm going to try to write over here. I'm really sorry about the whole uh, whiteboard situation. Hopefully that will get remedied over the weekend. Uh, no, I'm going to write over here. I lied. Um, oh, I have two erasers. Maybe one of these sucks less than the other. Oh, this board looks promising. We're going to work over here. OK, so here's one of our basic signals that we're going to work with. So, and we actually looked at it the other day. You remember, um, you remember on what was it, uh, Wednesday? We did a pulse, a rectangular pulse. Man, we see these things all the time, right? These things are totally like an everyday occurrence, and we need to understand them for reasons that will become more apparent as the semester goes on. But we need to understand what this rectangular pulse looks like in a frequency context. Do you remember roughly what the shape of the Fourier transform looked like when we plotted it? Yeah, remember I did this bouncing thing? The doing, 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 doing. OK, so let's look at that. Let's look at that. Okay, let's understand that process. So here's what we're going to do. Because I am lazy, and you should be too, um, and you know, laziness is a virtue, right? Laziness inspires efficiency. And efficiency is, that's like how the engineer rolls. Okay? A bad engineer would solve this problem 50 times. A good engineer would solve it once and then say, hey, I don't have to solve this anymore if I can just write down a formula. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to find the Fourier transform of this pulse. But what I'm going to do is I am going to, instead of putting in numbers, I'm going to put in like a variable for the, for the width. Okay? So that I'm going to get my answer in terms of that variable. So that after I do it, if I want to find a new pulse which has a different width, instead of having to start over, I can just change the value of A in my answer. That's what I mean by efficiency. We cool? Does that make sense? OK. Now, uh, I need to pick a height for this thing. So here's what I'm going to do for the height. Um, I am going to pick the height for this rectangle such that the area of the rectangle always equals 1. I don't have to do it this way. I'm just picking it this way, because I've got to pick something for the height, right? I mean, another way to do it would just be to, you know, to say the height equals b. I could do that as well. I've just found it's easier if I, if I start by assuming that my rectangle has an area of 1. Sound good? And if we ever encounter a pulse whose area is some value other than 1, we'll just do a scaling at the end. We'll just divide it by whatever the appropriate divider is. OK, and we'll, I'll show you how to do all that. All right, so if my area is 1, what's the height of this thing? 1 over 2a. Two Thank you for mostly guessing the right answer. Right, width is 2a. Height is 1 over 2a. As you learned in preschool, I think, you know, you, the length times the width. Uh, you multiply those, you get an area of 1. All right? OK, should we find the Fourier transform? Let's do it. Do we, we don't need anything else, do we? Well, we got a function. There's no period. It's aperiodic. Just a pulse. No period, right? All right, so a of, I'm going to squeeze this in over here, because this is the only unsoiled piece of whiteboard. I recognize this isn't good board technique, but you'll forgive me. A of omega equals? Integral. Integral. Thank you. OK. Integral from? Minus a to a. Minus a to a. I mean, technically, I'm integrating from minus infinity to infinity, but there's only non-zero stuff to integrate between minus a and a. So integral from minus a to a. Well, first of all, you've got to put x of t. 1 over 2a. Right, that's your x of t. And now, e to the negative j omega t dt. Blah. How are we doing? Have I lied yet? I might have. What's that? Yep, we want omega there. Because remember, now that we're in, in, in um, sorry, I'm just pulling up my notes real quick so I can make sure that I, um, I phrase my answer consistently with uh, what's in the book. OK. Um, yeah, omega is it. That's how the formula works. right? When we were in the discrete domain, it was 2 pi n over big T. Those were my frequencies, right? the frequency of the nth harmonic. In the 
now that we're over here with a with a aperiodic signal, and omega is just a continuous variable. So that's it. It's just omega. No, because that's the, going the other way. That's going backwards. The, the going forwards, there's no 1 over 2 pi. These are good questions. All right, am I good? Shall I integrate it? Let's make it happen. The 1 over 2a is a constant with respect to t. Sweet. So I've got 1 over 2a. Now I've got to integrate e to the negative j omega t. So that's going to be... 1 over negative j omega, e to the j omega t. And I'm just going to go ahead and substitute in my limits of integration. So it's going to be e to the minus j omega a minus e to the positive j omega a. I told you this is easier than, than, than periodic signals. What's that? You take out a negative and make it not a cosine. Yeah, if you take out a negative, that becomes a minus and that becomes a plus. And there's your negative that came out. And what you're left with in here is 2j sine a omega. Well, look, I've got a 2j here and a 2j here, so those cancel. So I'm left with... I don't even know a good place to write my awesome answer. A of omega equals sine of A omega over A omega. How you feel? We feel good? Are you missing the, uh, the sign, the, how I got the sign? Oh, no, 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 I got it. Random, random it's jaw. No, it's all good. You see that? It's what? J-W-A. Jaw. Yeah. Jua. 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 We can write it in French. Jua. Oh, there is an E. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Vous avez raison. Uh, okay. So, okay, what does that even mean? Okay, so fine, that's our answer. Bleh. So what? Should we plot it and, and have a look at it? I think that's the best thing for us to do is just plot it. Um, so sine of a omega over a omega. This turns out, we're going to see this all the time. This has a name. Does anybody know the name? Has anybody ever heard of a sync function? It's a sync function. So let me get this right. Yeah, not that kind of sync. Okay. <laughs> So this is called the sync function. And we'll discuss the sync function in a little bit more detail um, when the time is ripe. But now I'm going to just put I'm gonna, ah! Sorry. So we're going to plot this. We're going to look at it for about five, uh, ten minutes, look at some of its properties, and then we'll have a quiz. Yes. I did say quiz. You heard me right. Not x goes to infinity. A goes to infinity. That's what we're going to do. All right. Can you, can you see yet? No, you can't. All righty. So clear, clear the figure. So the first thing we need is a, is a pulse, right? We need, we need a pulse. So let's pick a value of A. Actually, I guess first we need t. Oh, I don't know. Let's say t is Madara Lin space minus 20 to 20. Let's put a whole bunch of points in there. Uh, let's pick a value of a. Uh, I don't know. Should we start with uh, 2? Why not? Why not, right? Uh, and now we need x. x equals um, 0 times t. And then we'll say x of x. Let's see. Uh, absolute value of t less than a. Sorry, this is like some MATLAB kung fu I'm dropping on you here. Uh, subplot one two one 
plot t comma x. Did I do it right? Yes. Uh, x. Let me just uh, let me just tidy up the plot, and then I'll tell you what I've done. Except it's not one; it's one over two a. Okay. So, um, so that's just my rectangular pulse. Agreed? Okay. So, uh, so that's cool. And right now I've set it that a is equal to 2. So you can see that it goes up at a equals minus 2 and down at a equals positive 2. And uh, it's got a height of 1 over 2a. So that should be what? A quarter? If a is 2, 1 over 2a is a quarter, and it's got the right height. So that's good. Uh, don't worry too much about how I actually created the signal. First, I, I made x equal to all zeros, and then I said, find those values of x for whom the absolute value of t is less than 2, and assign those values equal to 1 over 2a. So that was just a clever way of identifying uh, the appropriate values of t that I wanted, the appropriate values of x that I wanted to modify, and I made them equal to 1 over 2a. Again, don't, I don't want that to be the point of this exercise. We, we can talk about making pretty pictures all day. More importantly, I want to plot the Fourier transform. So first, I need a frequency vector. So omega equals lin space, uh, I don't know. Let's try uh, minus 50 to 50. And then we can change that if it looks like it's not appropriate. And a equals, we said, sine of a times omega divided by a times omega. OK. So subplot. Uh, omega, absolute value of A. Mm. Okay, not awful. Not awful at all. Let me just tidy this up. So, does it have the right shape? It's, it's, it's consistent with what we saw the other day, right? So a couple things that are interesting to note about this. Um, so this is the magnitude of A. Do you notice how it's symmetric across the y-axis? Magnitude is always going to be symmetric across the y-axis. Okay, we saw that when we looked at the Fourier series. Fourier transform is the same thing, right? Whenever you plot the absolute value of the Fourier transform, you're obliged to get uh, an, even, uh, an even magnitude plot. Okay, next question. Um, this thing zeroes out every so often, does it not? See how it zeroes? Are those zero frequencies predictable? It should seem like they're predictable, right? How, how can I predict where, the, where it zeroes? Right, I'm plotting sine of A omega over A omega. How can I make that expression equal to zero? Not the limit, not the limit. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I've got sine of A omega over A omega. And I want to know what values of omega make that equal to zero. Right, well, the denominator cannot make this function equal to zero. The only way I can get this equal to zero is if the numerator equals zero. So now I need to know what values of omega make sine of A omega equal to zero. So how do we make sine of A omega equal zero? A of omega, remember sine, sine equals 0 at 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. So if this is an integer multiple of 2 pi, I get a 0. So if A omega is an integer multiple of pi, <coughs> those should be the frequencies where my function zeroes out, which means that omega I should expect my zero frequency to be <coughs> no integer multiples of pi over a. This is not 2 pi, right? This is 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, etc. So it should be integer multiples of pi over a. 
Is that what I'm seeing over here? I don't know. What's my A? A is 2. So, if, so I've got my first 0 crossing should be at pi over 2, which is about 1 and a half. Is that roughly what I'm seeing? It looks reasonable. Where's my little, where's that little cursor I paid for? Uh, that, oh, sorry. I'm not yet comfortable with MATLAB's new little. <coughs> All right. Um, figure, here we go. Hold on. Oh, look at that. Bless you. As, as advertised, right? We said pi over A. Pi is about 3, A is 2, so we figured a, a shade over 1 and a half. It's right there. And the next zero crossing should be, uh, you know, double that. So instead of 1 and a half, it should be a little bit more than 3. So, yeah, exactly. It should, yeah. <laughs> should be pi, like 3.14. It's cool. So the zero crossing, so first, so first observation, it's symmetric across the y-axis as predicted. Second um, observation, the zero crossings occur at predictable times. Now, we've got to stop in a second so you can have your quiz, but here's where we're going to go with this. This is good. Just <laughs> okay, here's where it's going to get fun. Uh, I guess, boy, we're going to have to burn almost a whole week till we get back to this, right? Because Monday's review and Wednesday's the quiz. Did you know it was symmetric about the y-axis? It's always going to be symmetric about the y-axis. So it's a great question. Because the reason it's symmetric is it has to be, right? Oh, God. The reason it's symmetric is that's basically saying you need these frequencies in equal amounts to make the cosine, right? This is e to the j omega t. This is e to the minus j omega t. And if you put them together, you get cosine of omega t. So you need them to be, and remember the... the, the the multipliers are complex conjugates of each other, so, which means they have the same magnitude. So by definition, this plot, the magnitude plot, will always be even. The phase plot will always be odd. We haven't shown the phase plot. We will, but it's always going to be odd. Just to tease this for you, I'll put this online and you can play with it. If you want to mess around with this, what I want you to do is to change the value of A. Okay? And as you change the value of A, I want you to think about, I want you to look at the, the frequency plot and think about how, how the changes in the, in the time plot are related to the changes in the frequency plot because they're very related. Do you see how is, I'm making, what's happening? Right, I'm making the rectangular, as I'm making the rectangular pulse wider, I'm making the frequency pulse skinnier. And that's not an accident. We should have been able to predict that without writing a single line of calculus. That's not random. Okay, that, that is a predictable outcome of this, of this line of study. Okay, so I get it if it's not obvious yet. My goal is to make it so that it, it is obvious, right? That's where I want you to be. So you're like, yeah, of course it's doing that, right? What else would it do? So that's what, that's what we'll do, I guess, a week from today. All right? Quizzy, quizzy.